Hello everyone, welcome to your lecture on COPD. I'm actually going to be using a lot of the teaching slide set from GOLD, which is the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Disease. So when we talk about evidence-based practice, this is one of the things that we're talking about is looking at the literature, at the experts, to see what kind of guidelines they have put forth for how to manage and take care of the disease process. And so this is why we use the gold. Um, I've kind of broken it down into different sections because COPD is, is very long. It's gonna be probably more than you wanna know, but a lot less than you need to know. And that's because this is very common and something that you're gonna be taking care of a lot more as we go through the aging population. Same as asthma, I'm going to expect you to have a really good working knowledge of the medications that go along with this particular disease process. So if you haven't had a chance to look at those, go ahead and review those as we work through this content. So this is the website uh, for GOLD. It's the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. And I wanted to give it to you so that you would have access to the complete report. I've given you the shortened version for the report, uh, which should help you with management. But the longer version talks a lot more about the pathophysiology and the background for COPD and, and gives a better overview. So if it's been a while since you've looked at it, then you may want to go to the website and uh, just review the, the complete report. COPD is really about airflow limitation, and there's lots of mechanisms underlying that. And, you know, when I was a nurse, they used to say that emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and even asthma kind of went under the umbrella of COPD, and then they kind of moved asthma out and left emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and we still talked about uh, pink puffers and blue bloaters, and so we've kind of gotten away from all of that because we know now that COPD is a mixture of all these different things. So there may be some parts of it that are emphysema-like and others that are uh, chronic bronchitis. And you can have chronic bronchitis without a lot of airflow limitation, um, et cetera. So it's kind of a mixture of things that go and play together that causes this airflow limitation. So when it comes to the burden of COPD, we know that it's one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality worldwide. It's a little bit hard to get a handle on it just because it's, a, it's something like diabetes in that it's rarely the, you know, the thing that goes on the death certificate. I mean, there's usually lots of other comorbidities and things like heart disease that it's usually attributed to. So. I mean, even if it came out to be lung cancer, it would still, that would be on the death certificate. So it's hard for us to know. And we know that it's very under-recognized. Right now we know about, it affects about 6% of the population. It's a huge burden economically. I mean, in the U.S. alone, we're talking about almost 30 billion. So that, that's pretty huge. And we know that it's going to increase a lot because of the risk factors in the aging population. So, you know, that all comes to pack years. The longer that someone has smoked, of course, the more risk that they have and the older they get and the, if they continue smoking. So it's definitely associated with significant economic burden and also um, personal burden because this is um, definitely affects 
uh, quality of life in a very negative way. We know there are a lot of risk factors for COPD and of course cigarette smoking is the number one, but we also know that genes play a part. And we talked a little bit about the alpha one and how COPD can sometimes run in families. Infections as well, especially in early childhood or either premature birth can affect um, the rate of COPD just because of decreased lung development in the beginning, just puts you more at risk. And we know that socioeconomic status plays a part in COPD for, for lots of different reasons, but we think probably the main reason, reason is the occupational dust and chemicals, uh, indoor and outdoor air pollution, and then the environmental tobacco smoke risk. So all of those play into the risk factors for COPD. So the key points to uh, diagnosis and assessment. A clinical diagnosis of COPD should be considered in any patient who has dyspnea, chronic cough, or sputum production, and then a history of exposure to risk factors. And smoking, of course, would be your primary risk factor that you want to consider for COPD. Spirometry is required to make the diagnosis. The presence of a post-bronchodilator FEV1, FEC ratio of less than 0.7 confirms the presence of persistent airflow limitation, and then thus of COPD. So basically what the point seven confirms is that you have obstructive disease. And then we look at whether or not it's reversible or not um, to kind of try to figure out is this asthma or is this COPD. But of course, you know, the risk factors help us a lot. And, and to be honest, a clinical diagnosis of COPD is usually what I've seen in practice. The use of spirometry is, is definitely the gold standard and what I would want you to know on exam, but you will see lots of times that um, people are just given the diagnosis of COPD without the diagnostics that go along with it. So uh, just, you know, for your working knowledge. The goals of COPD assessment are to determine the severity of the disease, including the severity of airflow limitation, the impact on the patient's health status, and then the risk of future events. So we can use the spirometry and other assessments to try to figure out exactly where the patient fits and treat them with medications. But I, what this is really trying to say is that everything has to be taken into account, including the risk of future events and, and acerbations in the future because acerbations are something that the patient really doesn't ever truly recover from. So in the next um, session of this, we're going to kind of talk about how you do your diagnosis and how you figure out which medications. The other thing that you have to think about with COPD patients is that they rarely ever come in with just COPD. This is their only problem and, and that's it. So you always have to look at comorbidities. You know, one thing that I can think of right away is that depression and anxiety are very strong comorbidities with COPD. And as you can imagine, if you can't breathe, that's going to make you pretty anxious. And it's really hard to get people up and exercising and going to pulmonary rehab and doing the things that they need to do um, if they're depressed and they don't want to get out of bed. So, you know, if you don't treat that part, that comorbidity, then it's hard to treat the rest of the patient and the problems with that they have specifically with COPD. So always look for your comorbidities. Diagnosis of COPD. This slide is a little bit of a repeat, but that's okay. Some information needs to be repeated. So your symptoms are going to be shortness of breath. That's your main one. Shortness of air, uh, chronic cough, and speed of production. And then you're also always assessing exposure to risk factors. 
the tobacco is your main one, occupation, and then indoor and outdoor pollution. And then spirometry is required to establish your diagnosis. Assessment of airflow limitation spirometry. And again, I talked earlier about lots of times in practice you're going to see people not use spirometry, but that really isn't the gold standard. So what I would like for you to do is use spirometry. You know, it's going to give you a good baseline for where your patient is right now, and that way you it'll help you, you know, figure this out over a period of time, how quickly your patient's progressing and those sorts of things. So Spirometry should be performed after the administration of an adequate dose of short-acting inhaled bronchodilator. You're looking for a post-bronchodilator FEV1 FEC ratio less than 0.7, and that's going to confirm the presence of airflow limitation. Where possible, the values should be compared to age-related normal values to avoid overdiagnosis of COPD in the elderly. So you can get a little bit of overdiagnosis. And you can also get a little bit of underdiagnosis in a young healthy person or healthier person. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Uh, it's all relative, but uh, just look at your normal values in the age population. This is your spirometry for obstructive disease, and we said that an FEV1 uh, FEC ratio of less than 0.7 uh, is obstructive disease. So what they do is compare the FEV1 and the FEC. And as you can see, you can look at what's normal and then look at uh, how it looks for obstructive disease. And you're probably not gonna have to read your own spirometry, but this is pretty classic. So it's, I, something that I think that you could recognize pretty quickly once you got used to doing your spirometry. Assessment of COPD. You're going to notice that some of the slides are kind of repeated in the gold uh, slide set, and, that, and that's okay because it's important stuff. So assess your symptoms, assess your degree of airflow limitation using your spirometry, assess the risk of acerbations. And we're going to talk about that more, but basically if you've had one, you're at risk for more. And then assess your comorbidities. So all of those things are important for your COPD patient. Once again, your symptoms of COPD. The characteristic symptoms of COPD are chronic and progressive dyspnea, cough, and sputum production. And that can be variable from day to day, but it's not like asthma where you have it and then it goes away for a year and then next spring it resurfaces. It's, it's not that variable. Um, the amount of coughing and dyspnea is what's variable, but it's always present. So dyspnea is progressive and is persistent, which is kind of what I was just saying. And characteristically, it's worse with exercise. You know, you're not going to get more short of air when you're just sitting in a chair thinking about things unless anxiety is kind of a component of that. A chronic cough may be intermittent and it may be unproductive. COPD, COPD patients commonly cough up sputum. So most of the time with a chronic cough, when you're talking about COPD, they're going to have productive sputum. But, you know, don't think that it's not COPD just because it's not productive. 